thank you very much. I am a Norn. It's true. I'm a self-appointed, self-employed Norn. As you know, there are three Norns, Urd, Vardandi and Skuld, or fate, becoming and burden. They are, according to legend, above even the gods themselves. They measure out the fate and life threads of mortals and immortals alike, know everything and tell very little. I will, however, break the silence today and share all I know about becoming a Norn. Probably not that many of you have the ambition to become Norns yourselves, but there are truths in the quest to become a Norn that can be applied to many fields of work and play, especially those that contain elements of creativity. I have been a professional writer for 10 years. I write fantasy, that is, stories that contain an element of the fantastical, of what is, to most people, not real or realistic. I would, of course, argue that fantasy in many ways is more real than so-called realistic fiction, but that's a story for another time. And as Ruth already said, a writer is a creator of worlds, a fantasy writer doubly so. A fantasy writer creates not only the people that populate the stories, but also the lands they live in. She creates their rites and rituals, their myths and legends, their tools, crops, instruments and songs. And in the greatest act of Nornship, she creates the gods they worship. Like the Norns of old Norse mythology, the fantasy writer weaves the threads of life for humans and gods alike. So how does one become a Norn? How does one take that step, claim that space, navigate between the monsters barring the way? What are the best tools with which to slay the beasts of self-doubt, misconception and idealization? What to do when the compass is broken, a storm is brewing and all the paths through the woods have disappeared? And how do you keep in mind that storms can be refreshing? I am actually all three Norns at once, but mostly I am Verdandi, the Norn of becoming. And later on I will tell you why that is the one truth I know for sure. The journey we will take together today is not the classical hero's journey. The stages are very different, yet there are some similarities. But don't let yourselves be fooled. A Norn never leaves her home. She does all her work from her place at the roots of the world tree, where she fetches water from her own well and waters the story tree. Her adventures take place inside of her. This suits me very well. I'm not particularly adventurous, except in my imagination. A Norn is not a hero, because a Norn never reaches her goal. There's no jubilant return home with the prize. There's only the inner journey itself but it is its own reward. My journey is not a journey for everyone. It's not an example to be copied or the one true way, but my journey is all I know. I will begin by taking you back to the very beginning. Imagine a misty past where Urd, the Norn of fate, reigns. I've always loved stories. As I, soon as I learned to read, I was transported into another world, one I didn't really want to leave. I made up intricate fairy tales that I told my friends at daycare. Books that were about children who got transported into another world were among my favorites. The Narnia books, The Neverending Story, The Darkest Rising series. My meeting with Tolkien was life-quaking, because it was my first encounter with large-scale world-building. I wanted to live in that world. I cried every time I read the trilogy, because it was so beautiful, so perfect to me then. I could hardly believe such books existed. I think what was key here was that I absorbed everything, from the language of the old fairy tales my mother read to me, to the sense of wonder in the more current fantasy novels. 
My desire to be a writer began as soon as I learned to write. My mother has saved some stories I wrote when I was about five years old. They're completely misspelled and very hard to decipher, but if you do, you'll find classic fairy tales with a beginning, a middle, and an end, only there's often a small twist. After the poor farmer boy who set out into the world to find his luck and fortune has rescued the princess from the witch or the dragon or whatever, the two look at each other and the following dialogue takes place. So, um, do we have to get married now? I don't want to. Me neither. And so they go their separate ways. <laughs> but this desire to become a writer was my secret dream. If adults asked, as adults do, what I wanted to be when I grew up, I replied, deep sea diver or ballerina. Because I frankly thought my innermost dream was nobody's business, least of all some nosy adults. And I loved writing. It was fun and easy, and I was teeming with ideas. Until I encountered my first monsters. Yes, a Norn has to battle monsters too, but her monsters live inside her and are thus much more dangerous. They crept up on me during my teenage years, that's when monsters tend to strike, and were called self-doubt, idealization, and misconception. What had been fun and easy became difficult and dreary and frightening. It took me a while to find the right sword to slay the monsters with. Oh, jumped a little fast here. Um, I set out on my quest to slay these monsters, and the prize at the end was not a published novel, but the ability to write. Self-doubt came first, and an ugly black and green toothed thing it was. How can I ever measure up to the likes of my idols? How can I ever have anything to say of the same magnitude and dignity as, say, Tolkien? I gave up before I even got properly started, not daring to believe that I could have stories of my own to tell, in my own voice, stories no one else could tell in just the same way. Self-doubt also led me to abandon what I truly loved, which was other worlds, magic, monsters and dragons, and all the wondrous things that had led me to love storytelling. In my teenage years, these things seemed childish and silly and not the stuff of real books. <coughs> you know, the whole fairy tales are for children. Many adults think this way, poor things. They're too afraid to be taken for anything else than sensible, boring adults, just like I was. So they deny anything that is connected to playfulness, imagination, and fun. I desperately wanted to write real books, because I wanted to be a real writer. So I stopped writing what I loved, and began writing what I thought I ought to love, and thus effectively, effectively killed all the joy of writing. Idealization was an even bigger monster. It's shiny and pretty, and doesn't seem as dangerous as self-doubt but it's much, much more insidious. It tricks you and tells you lies. I wanted to be a writer so badly that I idealized the work. I thought that the only way I could write was if I had long stretches of completely uninterrupted time to write where I, the artist, was alone with my work, giving free reign to my creative genius. The thing is, there never was any such time. There never is. One doesn't receive writing time like a gift. You make time for writing. But it was a convenient thing to blame my non-writing on. Misconception is a grotesque monster. With two heads where there ought to be one, a mouth near its rear, seven uneven feet, and skeleton wings that can't be used for flying. 
Misconception is a relative of idealization, even though the resemblance is hard to find. I had many misconceptions about writing, but the really big one, the one blocking my path, was the idea that ideas for novels appear fully formed and drop into the writer's lap out of nowhere. This led to me sitting around waiting for such an idea and being frustrated that it never came. <laughs> it kept me from writing and from truly exploring the ideas I did, in fact, have but that never seemed to be enough for a whole book. I had also been taught to write essays in school in the following way. You got a topic, you wrote your text, handed it in, and got graded. I.e., a text was either good or bad. I never learned the most important skill a writer can have. Editing. <laughs> Taking something that is less than good, or even really awful, and rewriting and honing and polishing it until it is good. I forged my sword to battle these monsters with over many years. It takes time to find the right weapon, you see, to make it and train with it and find the right balance of the blade in your hand. There is no telling now in which order I picked up the, uh, the different elements for the sword. I had no bard following me around, making notes of my deeds, like heroes sometimes do. But one spark that lit the forge was my father's death. He died very unexpectedly at the age of 52, and he had so many plans of things he was going to do one day. And then, one day, there were no more days. It made me realize that if I want to write, if this is truly my dream, then I need to do it now, not one day. There was no postponing it any longer. Another important component to the sword was the notebook. I began carrying it around with me everywhere. It was my book for practicing writing. I practiced both the writing itself, but also writing anywhere, on buses, on trains, in the dentist's waiting room. This helped me slay the monster of idealization. I learned that I did, in fact, not need weeks of uninterrupted writing time in some isolated cabin in the woods. I was able to write anywhere. Being away from the desk can give you ideas when you think you have none because things are happening around you. You see new people, you catch snippets of dialogue, you see new places. As a matter of fact, it often helped to remove myself from the computer and the expectation that I needed to write a book. That's a very paralyzing thought to have. Someone else will read a book. <coughs> what you write must be brilliant. No one needs ever see the scrabblings in my notebook. They're for me. And this is key to being a writer. I write because I need to write. Because it is my way of being in the world, of understanding myself, and of trying to reach out into the world and offer up what I have found inside of me. I don't write because I want to be a writer any longer. I write because I have to and I want to. It's the act of writing itself that's the goal, not the written novel. And thus I was able to slay the ugly, twisted monster of self-doubt. Or was I to be continued? I also found when I wrote for myself and not for anyone else, I always ended up in fantasy land sooner or later. Even if a text began as a writing exercise, describing the cafe I was sitting in, for example, it usually ended up with fantastical elements if I just kept working for a while. When I wrote those bits, I felt happy. When I looked at them later, I liked them. They didn't bore me, like my holy realistic texts often did. Slowly, I found my way back to both the joy of writing again and to my home, which is Fantasyland. 
Fantasy can be so very many things. Most people tend to equate fantasy with Tolkien, or these days, Game of Thrones. But there are many different varieties, and not all are epic high fantasy sagas set in worlds with orcs and white walkers. In Fantasyland, there's a lot of room to move around for a writer. My books are mostly set in a secondary world. That means a world which isn't our own and it's not connected to our world in any way. But my imagined world isn't so different from our own. And it's more about the people and less about the epic scope of saving the world. I have written an urban fantasy, which is a story set in our world, but with fantastical elements in it, and a portal fantasy, which is about children traveling from our world to another world. For me, fantasy is the most effective tool I have to tell stories, to explore our world through the distorted lens of another one, to speak directly to the hearts of people of all ages, nationalities, and cultures, without the filters and barriers of preconceived notions. As a parenthesis, let me give an example of what I mean by that. One of my novels deals with honor killings. Could I write about the same theme set in our world? Sure. But as soon as I did, my story would start dividing my readers into us and them. It would be about certain cultures or religions in our world, and the readers would either be in a stance of defense or attack. By removing any cultural, religious, or national markers, I can let it be a story about oppression in general, and I can tackle big questions without having my readers get their hackles up or feel like they are having prejudices validated. I also decided to make note of every little idea I had, no matter how tiny and stupid or silly it seemed to me. What I learned by doing that was that I do indeed have ideas. I think we all do, even people who don't consider themselves creative. But if we never practice having ideas, we never get any good at it. You don't expect anyone to be great at playing the violin right from the start. Why do we expect creativity to be any different? By noticing my ideas and writing them down, I became better at spotting ideas. My antenna grew. And now, now I am always on the lookout for ideas and I always carry my notebook with me so I can jot them down. I now know that an idea never is the idea for a whole book. An idea is an image, a few words of dialogue, a place I find evocative a door that might lead to an interesting place. I don't judge the quality of my ideas anymore. I just write them down. And today I'm in the position that I almost have too many ideas. I'll never be able to write them all. Thus, a few of the misconception monsters were vanquished with my sword. Today, there really is no greater rush for me than those few and precious moments when the writing goes really well, when I hit that mythical flow everybody talks about. It happens about once per book, if I'm lucky. <laughs> now, every true fantasy sword has a name. I named my sword Practice. It might seem like such an easy thing, but for me it was anything but. I wanted to be able to sit down and write a novel without ever having to practice for it, which in hindsight seems unutterably foolish. The most important element I have forged into practice, my sword, is stamina, determination. I keep working even when it isn't fun, because it's what I do and what I love, even on the days I don't love it. And this part makes all the difference. But my sword was forged from some darker metal, too. I wrote on my debut novel for, I'm too ashamed to admit how many years. It was during my time of battling the monsters. I got rejected three times and each one hurt like hell. This was my lifelong dream, remember. And one I deep down feared I wasn't good enough for. I'm deeply grateful for each rejection, especially the last two, 
for they came with some constructive criticism. The first time I sent the manuscript to two publishers, one sent me a handwritten card with a simple no thank you, and a few lines on why the manuscript didn't work for them. The second publisher called and gave a few pointers. I hung up and had my first drama queen moment because, as you may recall, I thought that a story was either good or bad, and I had been working on this story for like three summer breaks, and couldn't they see it was awesome? <laughs> then I calmed down, looked at the notes they had given me, and realized that if I did what they suggested, the story would become much better. So I rewrote the whole story from the beginning and resubmitted. This time the editor invited me to come to her office, where she proceeded to tell me why the story still didn't work. She did so very kindly and constructively, mind you, but nonetheless I was crushed. I had rewritten the whole thing from the top. Were these people never happy? After calming down and looking at the new notes, I realized they were right again. Once more, I rewrote everything from the beginning. The final version only shares the names of the protagonists with the first version. Everything else was cut or changed or rewritten. And then the book was accepted. What I learned from this process was rewriting. I didn't know how to do it before that. And I'm so happy that first version was never published because then I would have had to be ashamed of my first novel, that portal fantasy for middle grade readers I mentioned earlier. As it is now, I can look at it fondly and see what I since have learned and what I would do differently, perhaps better today. But I'm still proud of that first little book, which was published in 2007 and is as of yet only out in Swedish. I still don't know what made me keep going because it never occurred to me to stop trying. I guess, guess giving up my dream was never really an option. I had doubts, of course. I still do. But maybe the monster of self-doubt never needs to be fully vanquished. It just needs to not get in your way too much. Today, the monster of self-doubt is more like a loyal Labrador than an obstacle. You know. Always at your heels, happily trotting along with you wherever you go, and sometimes you trip over it, maybe you even twist your ankle, but it would never bite you, not really. And it can be a good companion to have along for the trip, because a bit of self-doubt keeps you from getting too full of yourself and overly confident. I uh, guess I have domesticated that specific monster. It seems like a very Norn thing to do which leads me to the next step on the journey. Norns work magic. Of course they do. But what is this magic? How does it work? To me, the magic looks a little bit like this. In the beginning, there is nothing. An empty page, a blank slate, a new path to, to trod. I set out on my journey knowing very little of what lies ahead. The forest looms in front of me, full of perils, dangers and delights, and it's both daunting and exciting to get started. You might think that because I have taken this road many times before, I know where I'm going and how to get there. Or simply put, I have written, written six novels, you would think I have it down pat by now, right? But that's not the case. Each story takes its own path and they never look the same. I often start writing, thinking I know how to do this because I have just finished another novel. How hard can it be? And then the road that at first seemed wide and well trodden dwindles into an overgrown path at the blink of an eye. The signposts seem to have been placed by mad women. The compass stops working and the trees bend in the first gusts of wind from a huge storm approaching. The one thing I have learned after being a professional writer for 10 years is to have faith that even if I rarely, or as a matter of fact, never, 
end up where I originally thought I would. I will eventually end up somewhere, fresh and exciting, as long as I trust the process. And yes, maybe a storm comes along and throws me off course. But I, what I have to do then is grit my teeth and hold on and simply not give up. The Labrador of self-doubt nips at my heels and really tries to make me believe I will fail this time. But I normally have a bone in my satchel to throw to it, so it shuts up. What I have to do is trust the process. If I do, I will come to the end of the journey and there will be a fully formed story with people and lives and places and adventures and birth and death and often quite a bit of descriptions of foods no one in our world has ever tasted. It really is the story I thought I was writing. Hopefully it's a much better one. And hopefully the reader will be happy to take the journey with me. I never know quite how that comes about. And that to me is magic. In more plain and less fancy speech, I don't plan my stories very much. I might have a general idea of what they will be about, and I do some world building in order to set the frame around the story. Four of my six novels have been set in the same fantasy world, and I'm working on the fifth. So I, I already have a bit of it worked out, but each novel explores a different part of the world. So I do new planning and imagining every time. Once I have an idea of the place and a person that I'm curious about and a conflict, I start writing. Often I think I know that the story will be about a certain theme. In my most successful and well-known novel to date, Maresi, I thought the main theme would be honor killings, as I mentioned earlier, and how they affect the people living in societies where they're practiced. Once the novel was done, however, I saw that it was really a story about death and how we are to live knowing we will all one day stand before death's door. And it's a story about knowledge and whether knowledge has any value if it's merely closely guarded and not used. Readers have found very different themes in the book and that's as it should be. Every reader sets out on their own journey through the world I have created. And if I've done my job well, they should all be able to find unique paths through the enchanted forest. I write in order to explore things I didn't yet know, to uncover a truth as yet hidden. If I knew the true nature of each story before I began writing it, there would be very little point for me to write it at all. I want to discover, I want to learn, I want to become something more, something different than I was before. That was a bit about the magic of writing itself, but then there is the magic of writing fantasy. Terry Windling said in her Tolkien lecture at Pembroke College that it is in the nature of fantasy to be unknowable, and I agree. She also lamented the absence of the numinous from much of today's fantasy. And I was very happy when I listened to her lecture because she put into words something which has been troubling, troubling me for quite some time. Some of the modern fantasy that fails to speak to me is too orderly, too neat and well explained. There's only one main road through the story, wide and well lit, and the magic is lost. If I know exactly how the magic works, I stop believing in it and I desperately want to believe. I accepted the Force in the original Star Wars movies without question, because it was convincingly integrated into the world and the story. It was magic. But, but as soon as it was explained in movies one through three, the movies we all hopefully can agree to pretend don't exist, <laughs> as, quote, midi-chlorians, microscopic, intelligent life forms living in the cells of all living beings, and that the force speaks through these life forms, end quote, I lost faith. <laughs> Who can believe in that? 
Writing in itself is as close as I can come to performing magic, because I don't quite know how it happens. Out of nothing springs something. I see a man cutting a girl's hair, and around that scene a whole culture, an entire story, is slowly built, and I can't quite explain how. I don't want to either, because I don't want to know how the magic works. I just want to believe. Yay. And Norn must keep her magic well filled and water the soil of her creativity. I do it in different ways, by visiting museums and art galleries, reading and watching movies. The one question I, and most writers I know, get the most is, where do you get your ideas from? How do you make all that stuff up? And the answer is simply from living, from seeing and hearing and experiencing. From collecting everything and letting it compose in my subconscious. I note it all down in my notebook, as I told you earlier, and let it sit. I almost never start writing an idea when I have it. It sits and waits for years and is transformed by my subconscious. Eventually something will crystallize, a person, a what-if thought, a setting. Another very important element to creativity is boredom. Had I not been bored often as a child, I would probably not have become a writer because I wouldn't have learned to live inside my head. My childhood summers were spent at a cabin in the woods alone with my mother. There were no children around to play with. The only entertainment was the radio and the backpack full of library books we replenished a few times during the endless summer months. I had a lot of idle time and a lot of time to let my imagination run away with me. And I basically credit those summers for the career I now have. My biggest problem, creativity wise, today is that after the arrival of smartphones and so social media, I'm almost never bored. I have to work much harder to make space for idleness and creativity in my life. Okay, so once I have my ideas and my people, I start doing some more structured research, although my research is often very eclectic. While researching details for Naundel, my, my last published novel, for instance, I read about China's last empress, about women in harems in the past and now, about the real life of Anna in The King and I, about sailboats and bark cloth, about the execution method of slow slicing, about Muammar Gaddafi, and so on. The process of research is very enjoyable to me. It's through much of my reading that I find paths into my world. For the new novel I am currently writing, I have been reading about the life of Louisa May Alcott, about the Inca Empire, about the old Finnish method of transporting logs along rivers, about star constellations and many other things. Writing about another world is an opportunity for me to learn more about our world, which I wholeheartedly embrace. And the truth is that our world is so much more fantastical, odd, bizarre, cruel, awful and beautiful than anything I can make up. I pour all these odd facts and impulses into my creative mind and out comes something which oftentimes bears little resemblance to the ingredients that created it. And that is, this is one of the things I find so enjoyable and fantastic about writing. So, on my road to becoming a writer, what have I learned? What can I say for sure about being a Norn? What I have learned is that you can't learn. You can't be a writer. You are only ever becoming one. Every book demands that you invent the wheel anew. Your tools might become better as time goes on, but sometimes it turns out your tools are all wrong for the new story, and you have to invent and make a completely new set. Each story I have written has been wildly different to the previous one. 
Maresi, my fifth novel, was my first novel written in first person, and it posed a whole new set of challenges, structurally and linguistically. Now, Dell in turn demanded seven or eight first person narrators, all with their own distinct voices. While writing it, I did question my own sanity many times. But at the same time, this is how I want to work. Writing the same story, or in the same way, again and again, would be boring. I want to challenge myself. I want to push myself and to see what I can do. So each time, the writing process is new and challenging. challenging. And all I can do is trust the process. That is why, as a writer, I am Verdandi, becoming. Today, I have used very fanciful metaphors, because that's my trade. The flights of fancy, the imagination, the realms of dragons and magic. Not, of course, because it's unreal, but because it's another way of exploring reality. And it's the most real, exact way for me to describe what it means to be human. One of the things that's most important to me as a writer is that I feel I am doing what I'm meant to be doing. I do it for the joy of it, because it's who I am and what I find if I look inside of me. That's urd, fate. I love the process of writing, of becoming more and more of a writer of who I am. I could talk about writing for hours, and that's Verdandi. And skuld, the burden or the future, is the basis all art is built on. Dreams. Not an end goal, because there's no end goal to art. Someone said that you don't work the piano, you play the piano. Music and art is about playing. Not achieving a goal or a destination. The goal of a dance is not to get to the end of the dance. It's to dance. The goal of my writing is never really one specific book. I have colleagues who have told me, in all seriousness, that they feel that a writer has one, maybe two good books in them, and when those two have been written, there's no point to writing anymore. I don't look at art and creating that way at all. For me, writing is the point of writing. The art of creation is the most powerful thing in the world to me. It's my only way of being in the world, of knowing my own heart and mind, of finding meaning in a world which can feel quite meaningless a lot of the time. But the thing I strive towards is never to write that one great novel. It's to constantly grow, learn, become better, go deeper, be bolder. And I think, no, I know I will never be finished with that. The incomplete, that's us humans, isn't it? Both as a species and as individuals. We are never finished. We are never done. We are in a constant state of becoming. Thank you. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Uh, I'm Marit Eskelakarki. Uh, I would probably like to ask about uh, some traditions and literary examples that you have. Of course, you mentioned Tolkien and, and then Louisa May Alcott, and, and I was particularly interested in some kind of feminist tradition, or if you feel that you are part of some kind of uh, women's literary tradition or feminist tradition, thinking also about Margaret Atwood and, and some connections with your work to her work. So do you have any? And you also mentioned in the, uh, in the abstract about this mad women, and I, I, was, I immediately started thinking about this classic mad, women in the, mad woman in the attic. Yes. So, I'm sure you have been thinking about this. It would be like, nice yes. to hear about it more. 
Well, it would be nice to say that, yes, I feel like I'm in continuing in the tradition of Margaret Atwood, but I think I'm going to give a completely different answer, uh, and there's a specific reason for it, because I have just been um, going through my collection of old um, flickböcker, i.e. Uh, girls' books from my mother's and my grandmother's ch childhoods and youths. So they're sort of from the 30s through the 50s, basically. And and I was uh, putting them into a new cabinet yesterday. So that's why they came to my mind now. And in a sense, they're the absolute antithesis of that. <laughs> they're, they're the you know, opposite of, of, of Margaret Atwood. And it's all about being a good girl and thrifty and working hard. And, and uh, of course, marriage is the, the end goal. But not for all of them. There's also books about girls who buy farms together and work together on them and stuff. And I grew up on a very eclectic mix of liter literature, so I, and I loved these books as a, as a girl, probably because they were very safe. Nothing bad ever happened in them, as opposed to in my books. <laughs> um, and, and, and I don't know, it was something, but also I guess because they were about girls and the girl experience at the same time that I, I found fascinating. And they were very romanticized in many ways, in the romanticized life and, and work and, and romance and, and, and everything. Um, but I do think that there's some echo of that in my writing as well. And then as I grew up and became older, I started reading other things, and including Margaret Atwood. But, but, um, but my, my sort of foundation is this weird mix of that sort of older literature. I've always loved old books. I mean, Definitely one of my childhood heroines was Anne of Green Gables, uh, as well as the, you know, Little Women and, and uh, many of these other, uh, Pollyanna, oh my god. Um, but also then the mix of that with the fairy tales, I read and was read to a lot of, of, of fairy tales as a child. Um, and then fantasy elements as well. But when I started reading a bit more with thought, perhaps, um, one of my literary heroes definitely has been Ursula Le Guin, who's done a lot of, of experimental and interesting things with both science fiction and fantasy. But for me, she's really worked as a model linguistically, because she does so much with language and how I've taken a lot of, of or I've learned a lot of lessons from how she uses language to evoke the sense of another world, just through how she uses words. Um, and then, sort of, in, when it comes to, to Finnish literature, definitely a, a literary hero who I always bring up is Ismailin Sanman Lilius, who kind of showed me that, you know, because all the other fantasy I read was basically Anglo-Saxon. I mean, I read Diana Wynne-Jones and, and, and Michael, Michael Ende, okay, he's German, but, but um, mostly it was very sort of Anglo-Saxon focused. And then I read Irmelin Sandman Lilius and I was like, you can write this in Finland, in Swedish, and it can be about girls and girls' experiences. Uh, and that was pretty revolutionary to me. Uh, so she, definitely she has been a a, a, a path breaker, path maker for me. Does uh, fantasy um, frighten you sometimes? I mean, we are, I've been wandering around here in the museum and seen uh, traces of uh, very powerful fantasies like Kalevala and so on. And, and do, do, are you, are you, Yes. Do you do you be shocked? Are you shocked or surprised by, by the effect it can have? I mean that you are that's so powerful. I don't think I am ever frightened by fantasy. I am often frightened by the real world. Very very often. And last time I was I mean, when I wrote the last published novel, I, which is very dark, um, I sometimes took a step back and thought, can I write this? This is pretty heavy stuff, this is pretty pretty awful, things are happening. And then I opened a newspaper and realized I'm not even close to what's going on in the real world, so so no. Um, but but you also said it, the, the sort of the power it can have, yes, um, definitely, but I, I don't find that surprising, but I find it to be one of those sort of 
archetypical truths that yeah, myth and, and legend and stories affect us very, very deeply and very much, which is why I like having that as my job. Thank you for the fantastical talk. Um, you mentioned the review process, so you send your manuscript and then you get, uh, is there any other w way for you to find out w what is what your readers want or do you just write from yourself, from your own mind and your heart and what you like and only in the end kind of go through the review <coughs> process or, or do you have any other way of evaluating the yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't care very much about what my readers want. <laughs> it, uh, which is, of course, a truth with modification. But, but that's not where I start at all. I start from what I find to be interesting and intriguing and, and, and what, I, what, the, what story is it that I want to tell. And then I try and tell it as well as I can. And it's more about that. Have I done this as well as I can? Have I done this story justice? Does, does it feel right? And it's one of those things that's really, it's part of that magic. It, it's really hard to, to even explain, but for instance, there can be one element in the story and I just feel it's not, doesn't really make sense story-wise. And I struggle with it and I go over it and then suddenly, well, not suddenly, often it takes a long time, but something will come to me and it just feels right. Yes, click, it goes click. And I know this is how it's supposed to be. And that's also where I can, you know, if my editor, I, I have had the same editor for all of my books. I trust her implicitly. She's a brilliant editor and she always spots those places where I've tried to, you know, get away with something where I'm like, I know this is not very good, but no one will notice. And she's like, so, and on page 152, you, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. I'll fix it, I'll fix it. <laughs> Um, so she always finds those places. But then sometimes she can be like, should it really be like this? And, and I'm like, yes, because that's where I, it went click. So I know this is for me how it has to be. Um, but I do work on the text for a very long time, completely on my own. I don't show my work in progress to anybody uh, because I'm so easily influenced. Um, even the wrong kind of reaction or the wrong question can make me doubt myself and then that Labrador starts growing and getting more and more teeth uh, and growling more and more dangerously. So I have to be very careful and really guard that creative process and only when I've found the story that this is what I want to tell uh, and this is how I want to tell it and I've polished it and, and kind of start feel, to feel like now I won't get any further on my own. Now I'm so close to this story, I can't really see it even anymore properly. Then I can show it to someone else. Maybe sometimes I'll let some, some friend I trust read it first, and I take their comments, and I work on it a bit more before I send it to the publisher, who then has many more comments <laughs> often. Thank you for a thoughtful and beautiful uh, talk. I was wondering, uh, you, you talk about that you knew you wanted to become a writer and that's, that's your thing. And at the same time you talk about in becoming that you're never there. But I want to ask you, do you think that all of us, do we have something that, are, that we are meant to be? Or is it, because it feels so comforting listening to you <laughs> and that you know what you wanted, you know, and then you have the practice of course, but what do you think about that? I don't know, because I've never been anybody else but myself. <laughs> so I don't know how it is for other people. But I do very, I mean, I, am, I often think that I feel very lucky that I have known this is what I want to do. Because I, I mean, I do have friends and family who I see that are searching and haven't found maybe, and maybe never will, because I don't know if there's something for everyone. But I feel extremely privileged that I knew this is what I want to do, and now I actually even get to do it for a living, who knew, you know? So, so I don't know, but, but, if, but if you do feel that there is something that, that makes you feel like more of yourself when you do it, then by all means don't let anything stop you from pursuing that. I have to return to the question of critique because I think that's something as an academic that we can 
also relate to very much. And, and you, you were so humble, you, you said that, uh, that they, they, totally dis they totally desiccated your text and said it's no good, and then you saw that they were actually right and you could follow their advice and improve your text. But first of all, doesn't it ever happen that you get unfair critique? I mean, it also happens that, that you are criticized in a way that maybe you, you, you know that's, that's not the way you want oh, yeah. it to be, but on the other hand, you're, you're forced to follow it because otherwise you will not be published. So there's the power no. relation there. The, un the unfair criticism has always come after the book is published yeah. <laughs> by people who didn't get it. <laughs> um, so no, because th and that's why I cling to my editor, you know, and refuse to let her go because um, we, s we have the same view of the text. Which doesn't mean that you know I can be completely discouraged when I get her criticism, but I always feel it's fair. It always, she, it's always those things where I'm like, yeah, I know. Or then, oh gosh, I didn't see that. Oh goodness, good thing she caught that before it was published. That kind of thing. And and it's also you know really rare to have I think such a trusting relationship where I also really feel we're very different people, but she has very. She gets the text, and she is very good at giving criticism. And she normally remembers to say, "I love it," but yeah. um, so I've never felt like I had to make any changes that I didn't want to in order to have a text published. You already touched on on, on, on the second part of my question, which is, of course, the, that uh, fantasy writers and, and fiction writers are are reviewed in local newspapers and in, in, in the media, and, and which, of course, doesn't happen to, to academic writers to any greater extent if you don't discover something extremely fascinating, which you usually don't do in religious studies, which I represent. <laughs> so, so, I mean, um, what about that? How do you tackle that? I mean, you've gotten mostly incredibly appreciating reviews, but there must be also uh, I mean, harsh criticism, and, and how, how, I mean, what does the Labrador say about that? <laughs> well, yes, I have been extremely, extremely privileged with that too, because mostly the reviews and the reception has been very positive, and I'm still waiting. So with every book, I'm waiting, when will the other shoe drop? When will the shit storm come? <laughs> uh, you know, when will it go the other way? Because it will eventually. There is no such thing as 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 as, as not getting bad, you know, bad or negative criticism. Um, but it doesn't mean that I haven't experienced. I've also, I mean, there's been less than glowing reviews, and there's been, for instance, recently I did the huge mistake of listening to a podcast where they reviewed my book, and they loved it. Um, but then they had some reservations uh, about it. There were all. Wrong. <laughs> I no, seriously, they were. For instance, they were like, "Oh, but everyone, you know, I do object to it being so white, and that everyone in the book Maresi is white." I'm like, "I never say anyone's skin color. This is your interpretation of the text, and that it's so heteronormative." I'm like, "There's no love stories in it at all. <laughs> um, again, your interpretation of of what's going on." And that's one of the few times I really had to prevent myself from answering, uh, but I didn't because an author really should never go down that path. But what I think normally, if if you know, if there's negative criticism, I think, what do they know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, first I get really really upset, and then I think that. Thank you, Maria. That was absolutely wonderful talk. Uh, what I'm thinking about is a bit about the way you talk about your text while it's in the making, and then it turns into that book that goes into the world. And in your case, particularly your later books, when they've been translated, you need to return to and talk about books in different contexts, in different languages, and for different audiences, time and time again. So how do you relate? Is that different relationship to the book in Edinburgh, or the, the book, the text you actually wrote and talked to your ed editor about? And how do you reconnect to text you've written, sometimes even several years ago? Yes, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question, because it becomes, once the book has been published, I'm often already deep down into the next story. So, so it's like, oh, that old thing, 
or, or and it's also often it's also there's an element of um, it almost feels like that book has very little to do with me. Um, it's out there in the world and it's doing well and you know good for her, but but it's like sending your child off into the world and they're doing great and you know maybe you had something to do with it but now they're on their own, so it, there's a certain sort of um, distance that that's a bit odd yes. Uh, and, and definitely now when I've traveled uh, and talked about Maresi in other countries, and Maresi came out here in 2014, which means I wrote it, you know, during mostly 2012-13. So it's starting to be quite a long time ago, and, and I get questions about how did you come up with that, or how did you write that? I'm like, I don't remember. <laughs> I have terrible memory. Thank you so much for the excellent lecture. Can I ask about two aspects? On the other hand, imagination. Uh, how do you see imagination? Because it's on the other hand, it's uh, the reservoir of our experiences, but on the other hand, the faculty of connecting unexpected things together. And the other aspect in fantasy literature, how do you see the question of credibility? Because on the other hand, you have to have a consistent world, so to say, and be credible within that realm. But on the other hand, the readers unavoidably have uh, their understanding of our psychology and what is credible and so on. How do you see these two aspects? Um, so the second half I could probably speak about for an hour, but <laughs> the first one, I'm not sure what, you're, um, what I can add to that, but yes, the, there's the, the putting in of experiences into your imagination and then sort of making something new out of that, and I don't really know how that works, it just does, but, but I do think it's a, definitely a, a process of practice. Like, like I said, from childhood, that, that, that's something I've done a lot, mostly because I was bored a lot, and because I read a lot. So I also have some kind of innate um, understanding of story logic and story structure. I never have to think about it very much. It's not a conscious process for me thinking about how to make this story exciting or how to make it work. Um, because I've read so much that it just sort of is intuitive for me. But the credibility is a very interesting aspect of, of writing fantasy, definitely, because you want to create something that's new and different and exciting and, and evocative, um, but you can't lose your readers and be too strange. Uh, and especially, I've been aware of it um, ever since the second novel, I think, which is the first one that's set completely in the different world, Arra, because when you write in Swedish, in Finland, as I do, your uh, target audience is already quite small, and then you write fantasy, and the target audience <laughs> shrinks down very fast to be very small. And, and that's something I have had discussions with my editor about, is not excluding readers who are not used to reading fantasy. Um, so I have toned down, for instance, making up lots and lots of names and words, um, especially in the later books. I still have a hard time letting go of it completely because it's one of the things I love about fantasy and, and, and I find fun. But I have done a conscious, I made a conscious effort to try and keep it at a minimum of what I consider a minimum, because it does tend to alienate. And I do have, I mean, I have many readers who, who come up to me and say, you know, I never read fantasy, but I read your books and they're great. And that's one of the best things, really, because I consider them, my books to be a gateway drug to fantasy. <laughs> and hopefully they will read something else afterwards. But my, fan, my books are, are, in a sense, fantasy light. Uh, there are no other races than human beings. There uh, is not a lot of magic. Uh, and someone smarter than me once described them as psychological fantasy. And I like that epithet, 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 um, a lot. But I do try, I, I, I do make a conscious, I, I make the beginnings of the books especially, uh, I construct them with the intent that they will sort of lead you into that other world that I have. In Arra, for instance, I worked really on the first page already. There's a lot of very um, concrete things mentioned that we can relate to from our world. You know, there's, they live in a log cabin in a wood, and they eat porridge, and 
and um, drink strong home-brewed spirits, and they put out their children to the wolves if there's too many. So like, many things that, that both denote what kind of a world, and that's a bit harsh, and it's quite, you know, it's a fight for survival, but also things that are easy for us to relate to and understand. And then I can slowly start weaving in the more, more fantastical elements, uh, sort of have them sneak up on the reader a bit more. And then hopefully they will be as believable and relatable as the other things. Yeah. Oh yeah, darn. And I do think about the reader a bit. Uh, but often uh, not when I start writing or when I, when I do the first draft. That comes definitely up later. Do you like sometime, uh, anytime, regret something you wrote in a published book? Hmm. I will never admit it. No. <laughs> um, not really. Um, for instance, if I look at my first novel, then definitely, yes, I could. I mean, I read it and I think, oh, you sweet thing. That was the best you could do at the time, you know? But I can. At the same time, I can see that there's a freshness there, because I had no idea at that time you know, what, what was done, what could be done, what was the norm to do. So I just went with it and threw in everything I wanted in that story. And I, I, I couldn't write like that anymore. I have too much experience. And there's something kind of refreshing to me about it at the same time. Um, I have maybe not regretted, but now that I am writing a trilogy, basically, it's, it's Maresi, Naundel, and then there's a, a third one in the works, I have sometimes thought, oh no, why did I set it up that way? Now I have said that it's, uh, either it can be like there's a mountain in the wrong place, or, or, or why did I say he survived? I wanted him to die, but now I've said he survived, so now I have to work with that. Um, and, and, and sort of regretted those choices for a while, but then often, those restrictions have become uh, good for the story because then I've had to be more inventive and not take the easy way out uh, with the story and the plot. So no, I haven't really regretted anything yet. It was really lovely to listen to you. I, I had difficulties holding the cry at times. You talk so touchingly. So it would be nice to you know see you go to schools and talk to kids about you know being brave and, and getting over the, over the self-doubt. and You could talk to my kids about the computers and boredom and stuff <laughs> like that. So I didn't have to go to that every week. So. I do. I, I do do school visits and have done quite a, quite a bit. And I, I often talk especially much about the process of editing and rewriting because that makes the teachers very happy. <laughs> that I, I, I talk about how it's never good the first time because they always say, oh, I have such trouble getting my students to rewrite anything. But of course, I'm very glad that today in schools they are taught to rewrite. Uh, right now, I have been doing very few school visits and very little of that because I have actual deadlines for my novels in, you know, abroad. So I have had no time to do school visits, but I used to do quite a lot of them and I probably will again in the future when I have the time. Um, if we can now, to finish off, go back to the theme of the Norns, and, and I think you very wisely said that you actually incorporate all three Norns in, in, in your authorship, while even though Verdandi was the one that maybe came up to the surface most, um, the Norns, they of course, they held the threads of human fate in their head and they could direct human beings like puppets in, in the world, and, and as an author Norn, you you are almighty when it comes to the persons in your book and you can direct, direct their fates any, any way you like. But also, as, as we, we know, you are also, uh, for many young people today, as, as this question also touched upon, you're also an in the way that you are, uh, an, an, you are somebody that they, they look up to and you are an idol in a way for many people. So, so there comes also sort of, of a norn ship you have you have power over your readers in a way that that you are you are their idol. So is this something you 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 need to that you think about your role as as a, a furebild? What's the word I'm searching here in English? A, a role model. A role model. Mm. Is is that something that that uh, that 
that you need to, to think of as a norm? You mean that I have to behave well? <laughs> no. Uh, no, but I do... Um, I will answer it slightly differently than to what you intended, I think, but my books have been um, categorized as young adult, except the first one, which was a sort of middle grade, so for eight to 12 year olds. But apart from that, the, they've been categorized as young adult. And I don't think about that specifically when I write them. I don't think this is now going to be read by people 14 and up or something like that. Um, for me, the whole, one of the, the beauties of fantasy is that good fantasy speaks to readers of every age. Uh, and, and, and my favorite example for the, of that for me is The Never-Ending Story by Mika Lende, because I, I very rarely reread books, but that's one of the books I've reread ever since I was about 10 years old. And the first time I read it, it was about a boy who reads a fantastic book and he gets to travel into the world of that book and that is awesome and why does that never happen to me? Uh, but there was something else there too, not just the exciting adventure, and that's what made me return to it. Uh, you know, a year or a few years later, and then suddenly I started seeing the other things that are there too, the different layers of, well, but it's really a book about grief and, and a boy grieving his mother who's died. And then a few years later, no, it's, it's also about him trying to reconnect with his father uh, who's also grieving, but they can't reach each other in their grief. And now when I reread it, I'm like, no, it's about the re creative process and about getting lost in your own imagination and not knowing how to get out. Um, and to me, that really, it showed me what fantasy can do, that fantasy can really build this way with layers and layers and layers. And I do have readers from 11 to 90. You know, my grandmother's friends always like, I stayed up till 12 at night reading your latest book. Well, I stayed up till two o'clock. And you know, they're now approaching 90. Um, so, so then I thought, well, are my book, books YA? Are they young adult novels? To me, it's actually quite irreve irre irrelevant. irrelevant. Um, but I'm happy to have them labeled as young adult because of two things. One is because I write in a minority language uh, and I think it's really important for young people to have literature written in their own language, uh, reflecting their own reality. And two, because nothing ever affects you as much as what you read when you're young. When you read as an adult, never, it never gets to you in the same way. So I feel like, you know, in that way, it's really powerful to be able to write for young readers who might carry your, your stories with you in their DNA for for the rest of their lives or in, in their bone marrow kind of thing. So yes, that way I can influence the young. <laughs> I, I think all of us will carry this lecture with us for a long time also. It was extremely fascinating to hear your talk and I'm very thankful to all of you who engaged in this discussion which lifted the, the, whole, the, whole, the whole story. To, yes, to thank you very another, much for your questions. To, to yet another level. And uh, so let's say a warm thank you to Maria Turchanilov. Thank you.